My name is Brett Hoskins, and I'm a third-year clinical fellow in the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at Johns Hopkins Hospital. This is a case series study with the goal of confirming congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency using combination breath testing at home. Congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, or CSID, is absence or deficiency of sucrase and isomaltase. This causes an osmotic effect in the intestines, leading to bloating and diarrhea. Endoscopic duodenal biopsy assays are the gold standard, but can be difficult to interpret. Additionally, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, can cause false positive results. C13 sucrose breath testing can confirm CSID, and TrioSmart breath testing can rule out SIBO. This study included three teenagers with sucrase levels less than 25 on duodenal biopsy assays. All three patients completed both breath tests at home, followed by a trial of sucrate enzyme replacement therapy with assessment of symptoms four weeks later. All three patients had low sucrose digestion on C13 sucrose breath testing. Duodenal biopsies and TrioSmart breath testing were normal, ruling out SIBO and all three patients experienced improvement in symptoms four weeks later, but none had complete resolution. We felt that combination breath testing was useful to confirm the diagnosis of CSID and to screen for confounders. Additionally, initiation of sucrate improved, but did not fully resolve symptoms in this small group. We felt point of care C13 sucrose breath testing may be close, but larger scale studies are needed. Some of the pros of this approach would include a lower cost, less invasive testing, and the ability to use the test for follow-up testing. Some of the cons would include potential compliance issues and test validity when performed at home. Thank you. Challenge tests are widely used in medicine. They load certain body organ systems and uncover their functional limits. It allows to diagnose disease in early stage. Smoking persons every day challenge their lungs with cigarette smoke containing both cancerogenic chemicals and free radical compounds. It's well known that smokers most commonly develop chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and lung cancer. Some persons are predisposed to these diseases. The aim of this study was to test whether the analysis of exhaled air after smoking a cigarette can reveal the predisposition to smoking-induced diseases. We analyzed the concentration changes of 35 volatile organic compounds in exhaled air of 17 volunteer smokers before and during two hours period after the smoking event. Three of our observed smokers had a mild chronic obstructive pulmonary disease confirmed by spirography. Smokers abstained from smoking at least eight hours before the test. Exhaled air specimens were taken before, immediately after, each 15 minutes during the first hour, and each 30 minutes during the second hour after the smoking event. Specimens were concentrated on adsorption tubes and later analyzed by gaze chromatography and mass spectrometry. We see concentration to time curves of benzene in exhaled air. We can see that both the peak height immediately after the smoking event and decay rate by time were different for each person. Other aromatic compounds like toluene, xylene, styrene, ethylbenzene, had similar patterns of curves. Note that this and next figures, the solid lines belong to persons 
with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We see the curve for one of light and aldehydes, butanol. In contrast to aromatic compounds, instead of high initial peak, we see prompt decay of the curve reflecting the drop of exhaled aldehyde concentration below the pre-smoking level. The decay after 15 minutes was followed by early positive peak, which reached the maximum after half an hour, but after 1.5 hours, another late peak started, which reached the mid-maximum after two hours. Note that highest aldehyde concentrations were observed in persons with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Figure three presents concentration curve of non now one of heavy aldehydes. Initial positive peak immediately after the smoking event was followed by late peak 1.5 hours after. Notably, that late peak expressed only persons with obstructive lung failure. We speculate that late concentration peaks of aldehydes reflect their ineffective degradation by less potent isoforms of aldehyde dehydrogenases. Conclusions. We hypothesize that individual pattern of body response to cigarette smoke challenge reflects subjects' metabolic features that lies on the basis of predisposition to certain smoking-induced diseases. As this is a pilot study, further accumulation of data are necessary for confirmation of hypothesis. Thank for your attention. Prediction of response to neoadjuvant immunotherapy in patients with esophageal squamous cell carcinoma by a rapid breath test. Neoadjuvant immunotherapy has made striking progress in patients with locally advanced esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, ESCC, and provides significant improvements in survival. However, not all ESCC patients benefit from neoadjuvant immunotherapy. It is crucial to find precise biomarkers in predicting ESCC patients' response to the therapy. Tumor mutation burden, PD-1 or PDL1 expression levels, gut microbiome composition, circulating tumor DNA, CTDNA, detections and microsatellite instability have been investigated as prediction biomarkers, but none of them is ideal and widely utilized. Our exhaled breath is not just air. It includes more than 1,000 kinds of volatile organic compounds, VOCs. VOCs are end products of metabolism. They are generated during a variety of biochemical processes, like lipid peroxidation, cytochrome P450, dysregulated cellular metabolic processes, and even microbiome. Therefore, VOCs test is a promising non-invasive method for predicting ESCC patients' response to neoadjuvant immunotherapy. To standardize breath collection, a sampling equipment with a disposable mouth mask and an Tedlar air bag were utilized in each sample collection. A carbon dioxide sensor was incorporated into the sampling equipment to ensure alveolar air was collected. Exhaled breath collection began once the carbon dioxide sensor detected the carbon dioxide concentration exceeded 4%. All samples were collected by trained researchers followed the same protocol after written informed consent. Participants first gargled with pure water and then performed a single deep nasal inhalation followed by complete exhalation via their mouth into a Tedlar air bag. For each participant, 1,000 milliliters exhaled breath was collected with Tedlar bags in a fixed room and the environment air was also collected before and after sample collection. To facilitate breath testing of VOCs, we have made substantial improvement to the high-pressure photoionization time-of-flight mass spectrometry, HPPI TOFMS. 
HPPI is one of the most powerful and popular soft ionization techniques. HPPI TOFMS is a direct and online mass spectrometry that ionizes air samples directly. Thus, HPPI TOFMS does not require pretreatment. HPPI TOFMS is highly sensitive and it takes only 60 seconds to detect one sample. HPPI TOFMS has high ionization efficiency and it can detect most VOCs in breath, the detection limit is 10 parts per trillion. We have confirmed the efficacy of HPPI TOFMS platform for esophageal cancer detection in our previous study. In this proof of concept study, we aim to investigate the feasibility and accuracy of breath test for predicting the response of neoadjuvant immunotherapy for ESCC. We prospectively recruited 128 patients from the first affiliated hospital of Zhengzhou University and collected their exhaled breath. Retrospectively, 29 patients without baseline samples and 17 patients not diagnosed as ESCC were excluded. Depending on with or without the surgical procedure, TRG evaluation criteria and iRESIST evaluation criteria was applied respectively to enrolled patients. We finally allocated them to 58 responders and 24 non-responders according to their neoadjuvant immunotherapy response evaluations. Collectively, 82 ESCC patients administered with antiprogram death receptor 1 inhibitors, anti-PD-1, plus platinum-based doublet chemotherapies were enrolled and camerlizumab was the most used anti-PD-1 administration. Taken together, we collected and detected baseline exhaled breath from patients by HPPI TOFMS within 4 hours. Exhaled breath air was directly introduced into the ionization region through stainless steel capillary from Tedlar bags and mass spectrum peaks with a MZ less than 350 were recorded. Each sample recorded three times and only took 60 seconds to analyze. We illustrate two representative spectrum from a responder and a non-responder. The upper panel is the spectrum of a patient achieved complete response. The lower panel is the spectrum of a patient achieved stable disease. Next, we randomly allocated all 82 dataset recorded by HPPI TOFMS into training set and test set in a ratio of 7 to 3. We first extracted 264 features from breath sample and constructed a prediction model. Then we evaluated the model in the test set and repeated 5 times. With these features, Breath tests successfully predicted neoadjuvant immunotherapy response with mean area under receiver operator characteristic curve, AUC, of 0.73 plus or minus 0.09. By integrating breath test with routine blood test data, the prediction performance improved with mean sensitivity of 83.34% plus or minus 23.89% specificity of 80% plus or minus 9.61%, accuracy of 80% plus or minus 8%, and AUC of 0.82 plus or minus 0.10. In conclusion, distinct VOC profiles exist between responders and non-responders of ESCC patients received neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Breath test based on HPPI TOFMS platform is non-invasive, feasible, and highly acceptable in clinical practice. HPPI TOFMS based breath test can precisely predict the response to neoadjuvant immunotherapy of ESCC patients, and it may be a useful tool for clinical decision making. Nanosent is a startup company based in Israel, specialized in digitizing scent for the benefit of industrial and clinical applications. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we asked ourselves what we can do to help the world manage the outbreak. We developed a screening test based on breast analysis. This is how we started this study. COVID-19 was a major pandemic caused by coronavirus that, among other things, create inflammation in the lungs. To date, there is no quick and effective way to test large groups of people in order to isolate and treat those suspected of being infectious. Current rapid tests 
are antigen based and take at least 15 minutes to provide results. These tests require a swab sample collected from the nasal cavity and the throat. A truly invasive and unpleasant experience. Moreover, the accuracy of the antigen doesn't exceed 80%. The breast test that is based on the analysis of volatile metabolites collected from breasts has the potential to be faster, more accurate, and less invasive than current rapid tests. Volatile metabolites are uniquely suited to report on a variety of lung diseases. Analysis of breast-borne volatile organic compounds have been conducted for multiple respiratory diseases, included COVID-19, COPD, lung cancer, asthma, and more. Several studies have established breast test as a promising state-of-art screening tool, thus setting the avenue for the development of COVID-19 diagnostics. In this study, we aim to identify biomarkers in breasts that distinguish healthy people from those infected with COVID-19. We further divided COVID-19 positive individuals into two groups, symptomatic and asymptomatic. In addition to that, we conducted a follow-up study where we collected breast sample from symptomatic COVID-19 positive people in order to see if we can find changes in the biomarker over the course of the disease. Breast samples were collected using Receiva, Alston Medical Breast Biopsy Technology for breast collection. In this case control study, subjects that tested positive for COVID-19 with a PCR test were recruited for COVID-19 positive group, while those that tested negative were recruited for the control group. For the longitudinal study, participants provide repeated breast samples on day 7 and 14. Samples were analyzed at Alston Laboratories using the breast biopsy omni process. Untargeted GCMS data was pre-processed and 1,100 molecular features were identified. Regression analysis was then used to identify compounds of interest for each comparison, namely positive symptomatic VS control and positive asymptomatic VS control. This was used to calculate the statistical significance for each molecular feature. As a large number of molecular features were being tested, the benjamin Hochberg correction was applied to reduce the chance of false positive and to calculate an adjusted p-value. An adjusted p-value lower than 0.1 was considered statistically significant in this study. A large number of molecular features were found to be significant. We found that VOC levels were generally lower in the COVID-positive subgroups than in healthy individuals. This can be seen in the Vulcano plots. Furthermore, 91 of the significant biomarkers were common between symptomatic and asymptomatic groups, dominated by alkanes. Two candidate biomarkers were found to show an area under the curve that is larger than 0.8. A review of data quality was conducted with the important conclusion that the reduction in abundance of VOX in the COVID-positive group is more likely related to the biology of the disease as opposed to errors due to sampling or analysis. Regarding the longitudinal study, we found an increase in VOX levels over the course of the disease provide further support for the biological origin of this trend. Taken together, these results provide several passes forward for the continued development of a diagnostic test based on breast analysis for COVID-19 and other respiratory diseases, and showed that the novel field of breast diagnostics is an exciting and a promising one.
I'm Elena Jakšić from Biosense Institute in Serbia, and I will present the study about the food impact on breadwalks using portable mass spectrometry. Due to its non-invasive nature, bread analysis is getting more utilized in nutritional research. Considering the complexity of the food metabolism, extensive research among different population groups is required. To accomplish wide screening, it is necessary to establish novel, portable, and affordable solutions to complement conventional diagnostic techniques. To provide accurate diagnostics and diet recommendations, an individual approach is required. Food impact study on selected bread fox using portable mass spectrometry is committed to these requests. It is conducted by the Biosense Institute team with the European Protein Project the aim of which is to introduce a portable mass spectrometry sensor for determination of breadwalks that are related to food metabolism and lifestyle. In this study, exhaled breast samples were collected in one liter toddler bags from six participants coping with diabetes type 2 and 21 participants coping with cardiovascular disease. Each participant provided two exhaled breast samples, one before the meal, after 12 hours of restraint from food, and one 120 minutes after the meal. The meal was standard breakfast, white bread with butter and jam and glass of yogurt. Also, a cup of coffee and glass of orange juice were provided. The nutritional information is shown in table one. Concentration levels for selected bread, acetone, ethanol, isoprene and empenthan were determined in samples before the meal and after the meal using a portable membrane inlet mass spectrometer shown in figure one. It is equipped with PDMS sheet membrane, electron impact ion source, and quadruple mass analyzer. It provides mass scan range up to 300 daltons, while its dimensions, weight, and low power consumption enable portability. Every participant provided information about their lifestyle via a questionnaire. Summary of collected data is shown in bar graph 1. After analysis, breath acetone, ethanol, isoprene, and empenthan levels were quantified in samples before and after the meal for people with diabetes type 2 and cardiovascular disease. Obtained mean PPV values are presented in bar graph 2 along with the previously reported results for healthy participants. The food impact on selected breath walks was expressed by comparison factors. The calculated ratios between acetone, ethanol, isoprene, and empenthan levels determined in samples 120 minutes after the meal and the levels in the samples before the meal. If the calculated value is below 1, the walk level has decreased after the meal, and if that value is above 1, then it has increased after the meal. In the bar graph 3, comparison factors are presented as examples for each examined participant group. An increase or a decrease in exhaled breath walk level greater than 10% was considered as a significant change. The table 2 presents summarized comparison factors obtained for all diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular disease participants. Finally, the quantified exhaled breath walk levels and the data collected via questionnaire were used for diet and lifestyle impact assessment. The table 3 presents summary of one-way ANOVA on ranks statistical test results for several categorical parameters against the comparison factors obtained experimentally. Bolded p-values imply a statistically significant difference between breath walk changes for distinct categories since p-value is below the threshold, alpha equals 0.05. Significant statistical differences were observed for the isoprene level change upon meal consumption between two examined participant groups and between people of different age categories, and the isoprene and empenthan levels change upon meal consumption between people who are living in urban and rural environments. The VOX sensor has been successfully used for determination of selected breath box. Future work could expand the number of examined breath box and involve more participants to get more reliable conclusions which would contribute to the breath research field. Authors would like to thank the project partners who recruited the participants. And also I would like to mention that this study is funded by European Commission's project PROTEIN personalized nutrition for healthy living, and supported by Antares project, both from Horizon 2020 framework.
Hello, my name is Eri Schultz. I am a second year chemistry PhD student at IUPUI, and my poster is titled The Optimization and Comparison of Methods for Sampling Volatile Organic Compounds in Breath by Solid Phase Microextraction and Gas Chromatography Mass Spectrometry. So we know that uh, VOC biomarkers are expressed in exhaled breath, and due to the remarkable olfactory system of canines, they are able to detect these through their sense of smell. And this has inspired a, a lot of work that uses GCMS to try and identify what these compounds are. That being said, uh, common sampling techniques such as uh, thermal desorption units are required, and these are often expensive and require these additional hardwares to operate. So with that in mind, the aim of this project was to try and develop and optimize and then ultimately compare two different breath collection methods that are both SPEMI GCMS compatible and to assess the VOC profile of exhaled breath from one volunteer. And our two methods are called tedlar spemi and then the cryo cryotransfer, the cryothermal transfer of exhaled breath. And I'll get into a little bit more of what these mean. But the first parameter that we wanted to optimize was deciding whether or not to use a spemi fiber or a spemi arrow. And what we found was a spemi fiber with a PDMS car DVB chemical composition was a lot more sensitive in terms of the number of VOCs as well as lighter weight compounds like toluene acetone and isoprene. So therefore, we decided to go with the SPEMI fiber. Um, and this was done by inserting it into a Tedlar bag with exhaled breath in it and then assessing the VOC profiles. So going back to the two methods we used, the first one we did was Tedlar SPEMI. This is when a volunteer exhales into this three liter Tedlar breath collection bag. A SPEMI fiber is then inserted through the inlet of that bag, extracted for a designated amount of time, and then injected into the GCMS QTOF. And our second sampling method involves, again, filling a Tedlar bag, but this time cryothermally transferring it with a mass flow controller that essentially pulls the VOCs out of the bag into a headspace vial with glass wool, all while being surrounded with dry ice to cool the system down. And this method, again, is SPEMI GCMS compatible, but also allows for the storage of uh, the samples for long term at a negative 80 degrees Celsius condition. So with Tedlar SPEMI, we wanted to look at how long we should extract the sample with our SPEMI fiber. So we chose 5, 10, and 15 minutes as our uh, extraction times, because we wanted to still have a method that was relatively time friendly. So we did not want to exceed designated period. And we found that stepwise increase was observed for the number of VOCs, GCMS signal, as well as some individually probed VOCs that we looked at. Therefore, we decided to extract for 15 minutes with the Tedlar SPEMI method. Another condition we looked at was whether or not fractionating breath um, would have an impact on VOC profiles. So as you know, there are three different main phases of exhaled breath. There's the dead space, there's mixed breath, and then there's alveolar breath. And we use the clinical capnograph to see once the volunteer reached phase three or alveolar breath, we would open the valve on the Tedlar bag, allowing the breath to actually be collected. We compared this to whole breath and saw that for the likes of acetophenone, cumyl alcohol, and nonanol, increased signals were observed with fractionated breath. Finally, we did a much more global comparison of these two methods. And of course, based off this heat map, we can see that the cryothermal transfer method was a lot more sensitive relative to Tedlar SPEMI. And this is likely due to the fact that during the extraction period, the headspace vial is incubated for 45 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius before being injected into the GCMS. But that being said, lighter weight compounds such as isoprene and acetone were detected with greater sensitivity for Tedlar SPEMI. Um, figure nine shows the functional group frequencies uh, that were observed. So we saw an abundance of aromatics, saturated hydrocarbons, as well as unconjugated cyclics, and then a few more. And it further reaffirmed what was shown in the heat map that cryotransferring is a lot more sensitive. But to conclude, these two methods both provide different benefits. Cryotransferring allows you to not only have a more sensitive method to detect more VOCs, but also allows for long-term storage if you have a negative 80 degrees Celsius freezer at hand, whereas Tedlar SPEMI is a more rapid sampling method that also has a greater sensitivity for lightweight VOCs if that is the potential target. So hopefully these results and this work can help further enhance the field of breath biopsy through more user-friendly sampling methods. And thank you.
Hi, thanks for watching. In this short video, I will be talking about some of the work we've been doing at Maastricht University. My name is Robert van Vossenbos, and I will be talking about the detection of primary sclerosing cholangitis, or PSC, by fecal headspace in Excel breath analyses. In PSC, inflammation of the bowel ducts results in accumulation of waste products in the liver, causing liver damage and cirrhosis. The disease is closely related to inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. Approximately 8% of all IBD patients will at some point develop PSC, and almost three quarters of all PSC patients will at some point develop IBD. Therefore, to provide proper care, both patient populations should be frequently screened for this other disease. Well, imaging modalities to screen for PSC include magnetic resonance cholangial pancreatography or endoscopic retrograde cholangial pancreatography. However, both these imaging modalities are not suitable for early stage detection. Therefore, in this study, we investigate the utility of the analysis of volatile organic compounds in fecal headspace and excelled breath to distinguish IBD from PSC. In this poster, I focus on the fecal analysis. For the fecal analysis, 0.25 grams of fecal material was taken and the volatiles were trapped on thermal desorption tubes using the microchamber thermal extractor. The settings used here were a five minute equilibration time, five minute sampling time, and a 15 minute dry purging time. For the Excel breath analysis, the receiver device was used. Next, in the subsequent data analysis, the high variation of the fecal VOC profiles prohibited data normalization, which we would normally do using probabilistic quotient normalization, or PQN. To overcome this issue, we worked with log ratios, which we combined with some advanced interpretation. Finally, the final modeling that we did was on using random forest and the data of both platforms of the feces as well as the Excel breath was fused using proximity stacking. So what does it mean to work with log ratios? Well, we have our original data and what you do is you calculate the ratios between all respective features. And as a result, your feature space drastically expands. Therefore, you are at risk later on in the process of creating an overfit model. To deal with that, at the same time, we concatenate our matrix with so-called shadow variables. Those consist of the original features, or original log ratios in this case, but then randomly shuffled across all samples. Based on random forests, we then calculate our feature importances. We find the maximum importances of the shadow variables, and if our, then our original feature importances of the log ratios are smaller than this value, we regularize it to zero. In the next step, we calculate the feature feature matrix. This is a matrix of features in rows and features in columns, sorted to most important features first. In this figure, every single pixel is the respective feature importance of the ratio between two features. We then optimize this to find not only the most relevant original features, but only the relevant feature ratios. Then, based on this information, we can calculate our final model. Obviously, all of this is combined with internal validation. Next, I would like to show you our results. For the fecal headspace, we had a sensitivity and specificity of 78% and 75%, and when combined or fused with the Excel breath data, we even had sensitivities and specificities as high as 86 and 88 percent. We then had a look at the VOCs that were selected as being the most important ones, and we found that most of them were perfectly explainable using biological knowledge that already exists. Therefore, to conclude, the microchamber is a high throughput method for vehicle VOC profiling. However, the data characteristics show that it's suboptimal because we could not normalize our data. Also, PSC can be differentiated from IBD using fecal VOCs. And when fused with excelled breath, we obtained very high accuracies. 
However, larger scale multicenter populations are needed to prospectively investigate early stage diagnostics. Lastly, for the future, we intend to investigate the relationship between volatiles in fecal hit space and in excelled breath. Dear colleagues, the aim of the study was to create a mathematic model of exhaled breath condensate forming and to determine its factors effective on concentration of hypothetic non-shifting substance in EBC in the frame of the model. Materials Non-shifting Chemically inert component of bronchial epithelium liquid presented in the species with the concentration X was considered. The estimation of liquid concentration change during the condensation process of exhaled air in condenser was performed. The following points was postulated for the development of the model. Exhaled breath is an aerodispersed system. Dispersed particles are the sources of non-shifting substances in exhaled breath condensate. There are no any condensation processes on dispersed particles which are presented in the quantity N in one breathe. The concentration of condensed particles in exhaled breath condensate approaches zero value. Only water vapors are condensed from the gas phase of exhaled air in propagation of the air through the condenser, whereas aerosol particles are coupled and diluted in the generated liquid. All aerosol particles are included into exhaled breath condensate and exhaled air vapors are condensed in the condenser. Results For the calculation of non-shifting substance concentration in bronchial epithelium liquid for mathematic model of exhaled breath condensate forming the founder of Formula 1. Conclusion the Formula 1 can be used in clinical practice for the standardization of investigation exhaled breath condensate methods. Good morning everyone, my name is Daria Slefarska volak I am PhD student at Jan Kochanowski University in Poland in the field of chemical sciences and I also working in cooperation with Institute for Breath Research University of Innsbruck. I would like to present to you today a short summary about my research and I will be talking about the volatilomic signatures of AGS, SNU1, CLS145 and AGC27 gastric cancer cell lines. The main goal of this study was to determine the volatile metabolomic signatures of four selected gastric cancer cell lines, CLS145 and AGC27 compared to non-tumorogenic cell line, cell line HSEC, and also AG, AGS and SNU1 compared to non-tumorogenic cell lines GES1 and also detect possible differences between fingerprints. This involves determination of volatiles that are produced and used through metabolic processes of the cells and identifying changes in VOCs production that are caused by this cancer. To the best of our knowledge, the VOCs profiles in selected gastric cancer cell lines are described for the first time. For this study, headspace needle trap extraction as the preconcentration method and gas chromatography with mass spectrometric detection have been applied to capture and analyze the headspace above the cultivating medium and cells in the, in the medium. Altogether, 12 sets of cultures containing each three cell cultures and one medium without cells were prepared. In case of CLS 145 and AGC 27, 
cell lines and in case of uh, AGS and SNU1 cell lines altogether 12 uh, 10 sets were uh, prepared when it comes to sets all cells were cultivated in identical condition using the same materials and uh, protocols on the left we can see four pie charts and according to CLS 145 and AGC 27 uh, gastric cancer cell line Amongst the volatiles detected, 27 show differences in their headspace concentration compared to those above the cultivation medium only. 12 species were found to be consumed and 15 were produced by online under study. Of consumed volatiles, there were 8 aldehydes, 3 heterocyclic compounds and 1 sulfur containing compound. Whereas the produced VOCs embrace 7 methyl ketones, Three alcohols, three esters, and one heterocyclic compound, and also one aromatic compound. In case of AGS and SNU1, amongst the volatiles detected, 45 show differences in their headspace concentration compared to those above the cultivation medium. 10 species were found to be consumed, and 35 were produced by all lines under study. Of consumed volatiles, there were six aldehydes, two heterocyclic compounds, and one ketone, and also one ester. Whereas the produced VOCs embrace 12 methyl ketones, 8 alcohols, 6 hydrocarbons, 3 ethers, esters, and aromatics each. On the bottom right, we see the example of uh, possible metabolic pathways of selected alcohol and hydrocarbon. We can see, for example, that with alcohol dehydrogenase, we can convert corresponding alcohol to corresponding aldehyde. This step is reversible. Additionally, Using aldehyde dehydrogenase, it's the possible that this aldehyde trans transfer, to co transfer to corresponding acid and then to ketones. Above, in uh, table 1, I presented comparison of the emitted VOCs by all the cells under study. It, and it can be seen that ethyl acetate, ethyl propanol, 3-methyl-1-butanol and also 2-ethyl-1-hexanol sh show differences in all or three of the four gastric cancer cell lines. In addition, I can add that in case of ketones, we can observe upregulated production of VOCs, and in case of alcohols, it was downregulated production. In the end, on bottom left, the comparison of the emission of selected VOCs is presented uh, in figure one. These plots presented normalized concentrations, PPB per million, of selected uh, compounds. Based on the graphs, you can see that the AGS27 gastric cancer cell line is characterized by emission of a given compound such to pentadecanone and to heptadecanone and we cannot see these compounds in high concentration in other cell lines. In case of 2-methylbutanol, the highest emission we can see in medium when looking at the cell at the set of AGS and SNU1 gastric cancer cell lines, the ethyl acetate 2-methyl-2-butanol and 2-ethyl-1-hexanol on the other hand, were occurring in different concentration in all of the above mentioned cell lines. And in conclusion, the results derived from this study provide evidence that gastric cancer modifies the volatilomic profiles of the cell lines. Qualitative and quantitative differences in the cell's volatilomic footprints are detected. AGS27 and AGS cell lines are characterized by upgraduated production of methyl ketones with an odd number of carbons. CLS145 and SNE1 cell lines are marked by increased production of esters and the downregulated production of alcohols. Each of the gastric cancer cell lines has also a distinct metabolic pattern. And thank you very much for your attention. The title of our work is Development of Colormetric Sensor Device for Fast and Easy to Use uh, on the Sport and Low Cost Detection of Tuberculosis. Now, the objective of our, of our work is quite a bit similar to Olsen Medical, which is conducting the conference, but approach is a bit different. So we, what we are doing basically is we are colormetric sensor which will enable us to detect TB in non-invasive manner. 
it will be portable and most important thing it will be very it will be of low cost low cost and the time for the whole procedure taken will be very uh, less which is which is the basically requirement uh, given by the who and it's actually is very much needed for the development necessity the accuracy of the detection of tb will be far more uh, better than the reported ones which we will show uh, with our preliminary works that we have already done. The target patients will be from mostly underdeveloped and developing nations and uh, where such fast, accurate and low cost methods are required to detect TB. Now, as per the research and as per the GCMS studies done in the breath analysis of uh, TB patients, there are a few biosis that has been observed in TB patients are shown here. Those are 226 trimethyl naphthalene, 223 trimethyl heptane, and so on. So these biosis are most prominent on the uh, breath sample of the TB patients. And what we have used is that uh, uh, I'm a porphyrin chemist, and I basically synthesize the porphyrin code, as you can see in the left bottom of the slide. This is a porphyrin color sensors. And as you can see that if the color of the sensor is red, and if biosis that uh, the particular biosis, which is very specific to the uh, TP patients, when they interact with the red color porphyrin, the color of the sensor changes to green. Okay, so this is just a representation. But as per the molecular recognition theory from so theoretical scientific background, they are highly specific and the change of color can be exploited to detect this biosis. Now, as you can see in the picture that a girl is excelling, this is a very preliminary setup that we have. Now, you can see that in our study, we have used 25 indigenously synthesized porphyrin elements with different metal atoms in it, in which 94 participants were there, where 64 were tuberculosis patients and 30 were healthy volunteers. The overall impression from combined data to different PTB cases from healthy controls shows that in a normal calculation, statistical kind of calculation, we found that 85.42% of specificity and 78.89% uh, and positive 85 to 78 around and positive predictive value up to 86%. So that from here we can see that the if we we employ machine learning, uh, learning or AI artificial intelligence into the uh, picture, so the accuracy, the sensitivity, and specificity is largely increasing. So the our our goal is to now this to whole process we need to add all these machine learning uh, techniques to be more accurate and like to omit the human biases and inaccuracies. So this is a flow chart, the whole working principle that how we are taking the whole picture, uh, whole research further. That is, we are uh, first we are synthesizing porphyrins that I show the show you the pictures and metalloporphyrins and uh, all the uh, chemical techniques of purifying and we code them. After that, we make the sensor array around thirty uh, sensor array of th around thirty to 60, uh, forty elements, and uh, we do the RGB analysis by uh, before the exposure. After that, breath collection chamber, the sensor is kept, and that setup, we, we take two types of volunteers, that one is healthy and one is pulmonary. After the exposure, then we do the RGB analysis or the neural network analysis of the colorimetric sensor, and the, then we analyze the data. So with this data, as, as you can see that the accuracy and uh, the positive predictive value is very high. And uh, this is a very good, uh, encouraging results that we have got. As we, as, as we know that all the, um, this long uh, related disease, COPDs and all, uh, excel this particular viruses for particular diseases like lung cancers and all. So these studies, we can see that this can be extended to the other uh, diseases like COPD, cancers, COVID, etc. So references we have given it in the uh, PhD thesis of my colleague, Dr. Uh, Ranbir Pal, Professor Ranbir Pal. And uh, the, the, in the coronary cancers, the big sort, uh, the person who has worked extensively on this coronary sensor area is the K.S. Suslik and his paper. And uh, so is the other things. And that's all for my 
uh, presentation. Thank you all. Hello everyone, I'm Rakesh, presenting author for this topic. I like to introduce two fields that hold a lot of promise for healthcare. First is machine learning, which can help the healthcare sectors by finding the unseen pattern in clinical data and helps in prediction. The second field is breath biomarkers. In our axial breaths, we found many volatile organic compounds. This VOC concentration directly depends on body metabolism, disease state, oxidative stress, and the presence of tumors. VOCs are very much sensitive to bodily function. The burden of liver disease increases every year. The mortality can be improved by early and routine diagnosis, home care devices, mass screening, and awareness. Three target biomarkers we mentioned here are isoprene, dimethyl sulfide, and limonene. Isoprene is a byproduct of cholesterol synthesis. Dimethyl sulfide increases when hydrogen sulfide cycle is hampered, and limonene increases in the breath because of incomplete digestion due to lack of a sufficient required liver enzyme. The first step includes breath sample collection and quantification, then statistical analysis and use of data with machine learning models for prediction. After performing a thorough pilot study, we fixed the breath collection protocol, which includes a two minutes of exercise that causes the isoprene to increase, which creates a concentration profile change that helps the machine learning model to do prediction. The database was first pre-processed and split into training and test set. At first, model parameters are fixed, then trained for supervised learning, then validation results are obtained. Then the untrained data or test portion is tested and the performance parameters are calculated. A significant change in the concentration of said VOCs are observed in both the groups because of liver sickness. The design data set with feature set and target variables or class is split into training and test portion. In model development stage, a grid search method is performed on training data set to tune the hyperparameters. There are two different cross validations commonly used, which are K4 cross validation and leave one out cross validation. Once the model is trained, then it predicts the outcome based on the test data. The performance of models evaluated by using corresponding performance matrices. The breed data is used with a random forest classification model to classify patients and control. The cross validation result was found to be more than 90%. The test data set confusion matrix shows a smaller number of false positive and false negative result. The test data set gives a classification report of about 88% accuracy. The ROC score, the higher is better, is about 90%. Regression model trains and predicts the liver disease severity based on three different clinical scores. The mean absolute error for each score shows an acceptable value because it is less than 10% of the population mean. The plot with an R squared value shows the closeness between real and predicted values, which is a good fit. A principal component analysis by plot gives a dimension reduction visualization of data set. This figure shows the panel of biomarkers separate health uh, to patients based on their severity, based on child flu score. A disease-specific sample collection is somewhat sometimes challenging. So to overcome the imbalance on the data set, for example, between controls and target study subjects, there are hyperparameters available in some models, or the data set can be balanced using oversampling and undersampling approach. By producing synthetic sample points, data set can be increased, or by deleting redundant or outlier data set can be reduced. A sampled or balanced data set also contribute to model training and performance. So a Balanced data set results always stand superior than an imbalanced data set. The improvement in classification parameters seems to be improved. The recall value indicates a balanced number of samples picked from both classes have been improved after sampling. And this improvement prediction on both classes and contribute to an increase in the ROC score. This finding holds a promise of prediction to help diagnosis, routine measurement, and home care using limitless stock of axial breath. If this model is practiced and studied, a bigger data set may unfold many possibilities that will help the healthcare sector in a whole new different way. Thanks for watching.
dear colleagues, the key links in the pathogenesis of bronchial asthma are oxidative and nitrosative stress, accompanied by hyperproduction of reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. The aim of the work was to study the effect of ROS production on the state of the no cycle in patients with exacerbation of mild bronchial asthma. Methods 68 people were examined. The group of patients with bronchial asthma exacerbation included 38 people. The control group consisted of 30 practically healthy volunteers. Exhaled no. Pheno. No metabolites. The total concentration of nitrates. Nitrites in exhaled breath condensate. Malandiordigide in blood serum and the intensity of the S hemiluminescent response of activated blood phagocytes were determined in all patients. Results. The parameters of the nitric oxide cycle in asthma significantly exceeded the values of the control group. The levels of total concentration of nitrates, nitrites in the exhaled breath condensate in asthma were 16.1 plus or minus 2.6 mu m against 5.1 plus or minus 2.7 mu m in the control. The concentrations of pheno 17.2 plus or minus 4.1 ppb and 6.5 plus or minus 3.1 ppb, p equals 0.0017, respectively. Similar dynamics was found in the study of ROS production by the intensity of the chemiluminescent response of blood phagocytes and the level of MDA in the blood serum in the studied groups. In patients with BA, S hemiluminescent response was 11.42 plus or minus 2.25 and 3.2 times higher than the control. The MDA concentration was 5.77 plus or minus 0.82 micro m in asthma and 2.33 plus or minus 0.87 micro m in the control group. A negative correlation was found between pheno and S hemiluminescent response. R equals minus 0.73, P equals 0.003. Conclusion. Thus, during an exacerbation of mild asthma, hyperproduction of ROS can affect the level of exhaled nitric oxide, as well as the no cycle. Dear colleagues, in this work, we present a structural scheme for a universal nitric oxide synthase catalytic cycle model, which can be used to describe the functions of all major enzyme isoforms. The resulting three-stroke scheme allows us to fit together the available information on the interaction and algorithm of the enzyme domains and binding active centers both under normal physiological conditions and under conditions of hypoxia, substrate deficiency, or reduced rate of nitric oxide release from the enzyme pocket, which leads to the initiation of pathological variants of the cycle. Depending on the degree of hypoxia, three options are possible. 1. With severe hypoxia, the cycle is blocked at the very beginning. There is no consumption of the substrate, arginine, the ferrous heme complex is stable. 2. With moderate oxygen deficiency, ferrous heme oxy complex is reduced by tetrahydrobiopterin to reducing form, 
which reacts with arginine to form N-hydroxy-L-arginine. The resulting ferric heme is reduced by the second electron from the reductase domain and oxidized by the tetrahydrobiopteran radical. The third electron from the reductase domain reduces ferric heme to ferrous heme complex. Then the cycle is blocked. 3. With insignificant oxygen deficiency, tetrahydrobiopterin activates the ferrous heme oxy complex to reduced ferrous heme oxy complex, turning into the tetrahydrobiopterin radical. Reduced ferrous heme oxy complex reacts with N hydroxy L arginine, forming ferrous heme nitric oxide complex. The tetrahydrobiopterin radical oxidizes ferrous heme nitric oxide complex to ferric heme nitric oxide complex. In normal case, ferric heme nitric oxide complex releases nitric oxide, which leaves the enzyme pocket. If this does not happen, then nitric oxide is repeatedly bound and released from the ferric heme nitric oxide complex. In this case, the next electron coming from flavin mononucleotide will reduce either ferric heme or ferroic heme nitric oxide complex. In the first case, cycle is completed with a slight delay. In the second case, Ferric heme nitric oxide complex is reduced to ferrous heme nitric oxide complex, which releases nitric oxide very slowly. The unproductive branch of the cycle is turned on. The scheme also makes possible to explain a number of features of the behavior of nitric oxide synthase, such as the production of nitrate anions in case of delay of nitric oxide release from the enzyme pocket. The rapid generation of the superoxide anion radical under conditions of lack of substrate, L-arginine, etc. During the scheme formation, an assumption was made about the peculiarities of tetrahydrobiopterin functioning, which allowed us to isolate the closed cycle of tetrahydrobiopterin reactions within the catalytic cycle of nitric oxide synthase. This allows tetrahydrobiopterin to provide and accelerate the cycle without wasting. The presented structural scheme allows to create a simulation model of the enzymatic part of the nitric oxide cycle for predicting nitric oxide synthase behavior in common pathological conditions. Very good day to all. My name is Nitish Vya from Center of Excellence for Biophotonics, Department of Atomic and Molecular Physics, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Here I'm going to present my work on UV photoacoustic sensor for breath analysis, a pilot study of asthma and COPD. Research and development have been progressing for the past several years to diagnose diseases by breath analysis. The techniques like CT scan, MRI, PET, etc. are very expensive and beyond the reach of majority of population since they will be available only in multi-specialty hospitals in big cities. A solution to this problem is the development of cost-effective, highly non-invasive breath analysis setup for the detection of markers known as volatile organic compounds which can be used not only in big multi-specialty hospitals but which can also be conveniently used by trained technicians in small hospitals or clinics, community health care centers, and medical camps organized by major hospitals and charitable organizations. Photoacoustic spectroscopy is one of the widely accepted methods for the detection and identification of molecules in gaseous phase due to its high sensitivity and ease of operation. We have designed and assembled a photoacoustic sensor for the detection of VOCs. A microphone followed by the amplifier is used as the detector of a photoacoustic sensor. The sample insertion module is locally assembled. 
photoacoustic signal is recorded in the frequency domain using lab one software. A quadrupled pulse India glacier having wavelength of 266 nanometer is used as the stationary light source in photoacoustic setup as shown in figure one. Breath samples from asthma, COPD and normal subjects have been collected from Department of Respiratory Medicine, Kasupra Medical College, Manipal. We have collected 24 asthma, 25 normal and 20 COPD patients and recorded using PAS setup. All samples were recorded in a lab temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and humidity of 56 percentage. An average photoacoustic signal of asthma, COPD and normal samples and their descriptive statistics are shown in figure 2. So there is a difference between normal asthma and COPD samples signals. So we have performed principal command analysis for the classification between asthma, normal and COPD samples. Scroll product representing PC1 versus PC2 is shown in figure 3. So A represents the classification between asthma, COPD and normal and B represent the classification between asthma and normal. C represent the classification between COPD and normal. D represent the classification between asthma and COPD. So we have performed a maximized analysis using Mahalabish distance and some of the uh, squared differences of stimulated and actual signals known as spectral residual using a calibration set of normal samples had given a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 89%. Mahalabit distance was a spectral residual obtained from match normal study with normal calibration set is shown in figure 4, where black dots represent normal and blue represent COPD and red represent asthma. In conclusion, a photoacoustic breath analysis experiment has been carried out with asthma, normal and COPD sample. Multivariant analysis such as PCA and match normal study has been performed. The sensor has got a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 89%. UV photoacoustic spectroscopy followed by multivariate analysis can be used for the diagnosis of asthma and COPD sample. These are some of the references. The others are thankful to Manipal Academy of Higher Education for the research facility for setting up of the photoacoustic spectrometer. And myself, thanks, thankful to Manipal Academy of Higher Education for Dr. TMA by Dr. Fellowship. Thank you for listening my poster. Thank you, everyone. Hello, I am Robert Rintoul, a clinical academic at the University of Cambridge and Royal Papworth Hospital, and I'm the chief investigator for the Evolution Study. I'm working with the Alstone Medical preclinical and clinical teams on early detection approaches in lung cancer. Lung cancer, the leading cause of cancer death worldwide, has poor outcomes. Currently, the five-year survival rate for all comers is around 16% in the UK. The main issue being that around three quarters of patients present with advanced stage disease. However, if lung cancer can be diagnosed at an early stage, treatment with curative intent can be offered. Outcomes for early stage disease are much better, ranging from 70 to 90 percent five year survival. At present, the main tool for early diagnosis of lung cancer is CT scanning. However, access to CT for early diagnosis is currently limited, although recently the National Screening Committee have recommended to the government that national programmes for lung cancer screening should be established. The development of a breath biomarker for the diagnosis of lung cancer would be an attractive non-invasive approach that may be more affordable and accessible. Because breath is a complex sampling matrix, high background levels of volatile organic compounds and inconsistent sampling methods have limited progress in the development of a clinically relevant breath test for lung cancer. 
One potential solution is use of EVOC probes, the administration of a molecular probe responsive to a disease specific metabolic pathway, resulting in a product which can be detected on the breath. Here we explore the use of D5 ethyl glucuronide, a substrate for beta glucuronidase, an enzyme found in the lysosomes of healthy tissue cells. Because D5 ethyl glucuronide has low cellular permeability, it cannot penetrate into the cell to be metabolized by beta glucuronidase in healthy tissue. However, in solid tumors, it has been shown that beta glucuronidase is expressed in the extracellular space and therefore is accessible to the probe, resulting in the release of D5 ethanol, which can be detected on breath. And these pathways are shown in figure one. In figure two, we've confirmed the extracellular activity of beta glucuronidase in lung cancer cell lines compared to normal fibroblasts, and in patient-derived xenograft tumour models compared to normal mice lung tissue. In 2019, Lang et al. published the use of D5 ethyl glucuronide as an EVOC probe in mice, showing a clear difference in D5 ethanol formation between tumour-bearing mice and healthy mice. On the graph in figure three, you can see correlation of D5 ethanol labels with increasing tumour size. In contrast, no or very low levels of D5 ethanol were observed in healthy mice. To assess if this mechanism is also present in human lung cancer, immunohistochemistry was performed on multiple lung cancer samples and normal lung tissue. We observed the expression of beta glucuronidase in the tumour microenvironment of all types of lung cancer and at every tumour stage, including stage one and two, which is encouraging for an early detection approach. We did not observe any extracellular expression in healthy lung tissue. Recently, we've designed and initiated the Evolution Clinical Study, the outline for which is shown in figure five. Phase 1A of this study is a safety assessment in healthy controls, and phase 1B, a dose optimization study in subjects with and without lung cancer. Phase 1A, completed in 2021, had a very favorable safety profile without any concerning adverse events. In phase 1B, we're determining the optimal dose and time point for breath sampling after probe administration. Interim analyses will be done during this phase to determine if dose has to be changed or if a different time point for breath sampling selected. So far, we've analysed the breath samples of six healthy controls and eight lung cancer patients, all with early stage cancers. Figure six shows the use of two batches of the probe. In the original batch, we examined one lung cancer case and six healthy controls. Very low or no signal was detected in the healthy individuals with a higher response in the lung cancer patient. Some background signal in healthy subjects was the result of an impurity in the probe. A new purer version of the probe has now been synthesized and administered to six more lung cancer patients to date. In conclusion, through a combination of in vitro, in vivo and clinical work, we've produced initial evidence to support the application of D5 ethyl glucuronide as an EVOC probe to evaluate non-invasive breath testing as a means for early detection of lung cancer. We've shown that D5 ethyl glucuronide leads to production of D5 ethanol in the presence of lung cancer. We've evaluated the relevance of the molecular pathway targeted by D5 ethyl glucuronide in samples of lung cancer and have early data showing that D5 ethyl glucuronide is safe and acceptable for use in patients.
My name is Brett Hoskins, and I'm a third-year clinical fellow in the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at Johns Hopkins Hospital. This is a case series study with the goal of confirming congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency using combination breath testing at home. Congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, or CSID, is absence or deficiency of sucrase and isomaltase. This causes an osmotic effect in the intestines, leading to bloating and diarrhea. Endoscopic duodenal biopsy assays are the gold standard, but can be difficult to interpret. Additionally, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, can cause false positive results. C13 sucrose breath testing can confirm CSID, and TrioSmart breath testing can rule out SIBO. This study included three teenagers with sucrase levels less than 25 on duodenal biopsy assays. All three patients completed both breath tests at home, followed by a trial of sucrate enzyme replacement therapy with assessment of symptoms four weeks later. All three patients had low sucrose digestion on C13 sucrose breath testing. Duodenal biopsies and TrioSmart breath testing were normal, ruling out SIBO and all three patients experienced improvement in symptoms four weeks later, but none had complete resolution. We felt that combination breath testing was useful to confirm the diagnosis of CSID and to screen for confounders. Additionally, initiation of sucrate improved, but did not fully resolve symptoms in this small group. We felt point of care C13 sucrose breath testing may be close, but larger scale studies are needed. Some of the pros of this approach would include a lower cost, less invasive testing, and the ability to use the test for follow-up testing. Some of the cons would include potential compliance issues and test validity when performed at home. Thank you.